Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to yet another Warhammer 40k lore video, where today we are going to be talking about the Codex Astartes, uh, the big book of absolutely goddamn everything, or at the very least, so the Ultramarines would have you believe, as it was penned by their beloved Primarch Rabute Gilliman, shortly after the proper outbreak of the Horus Heresy had arrived in Macragian space. Or more precisely, Kalth had happened. Kalth was supposed to be a joint crusade on behalf of the Wordbearers and the Ultramarines, two legions that had for a very long time been at odds with one another after the Ultramarines were part of the rather harsh chastisement of the Wordbearers' Legion and the burning of Monarchia, Logar's perfect city. The two legions were supposed to crusade together against the Greenskins to foster a bit of cooperation between the two old foes? Well, that's not necessarily a correct term, really. The Ultramarines did not hold a great deal of a grudge against the Wordbearers, whilst the Wordbearers, on the other hand, held on to a considerable quantity of butthurt against the Ultramarines, and Kalth was to be their revenge. Since the Joint Crusade, of course, had been organised by Horus, the War Master, as a means of trying to break the back of the Ultramarines Legion. The word bearers arrived in considerable quantity and were allowed down onto the surface of Kalth because why wouldn't they? They were the allies of the Ultramarines after all, and in orbit the word bearers' war vessels simply moved into formation alongside their Ultramarines' opposites. When the signal was given, the violence, bloodshed and slaughter unleashed was on a near unimaginable level, and were it not for power struggles within the Wordbearers Legion that ensured that the Wordbearers did not send their best or brightest, nor did they fully support them, for reasons that, well, we shan't get into here, but suffice to say, treachery was afoot, not just against the Ultramarines. Uh, this resulted in the Ultramarines actually winning the Battle of Karth. They had been bloodied, they had been bruised, they had been battered, and they had been mauled more severely than in any previous engagement in their long and storied history, but they had not been broken. In the long term, this failure to break the Ultramarines' legion at Kalth uh, was to prove a fatal flaw in Horus's grand design, and it would not be the first or last such flaw created by his brother's lack of control, both over themselves and their legions. But for now, it appeared as if the primary directives had all been met. The Ultramarines may not have broken, but they were bruised and bloodied, and the Ruin Storm had also been created. A massive warp storm that, in theory, would mean that any travel between the Imperium of Man and the realms of Ultramar would be de facto impossible at worst, and merely suicidal at best. It seemed as if the Ultramarines Legion had been put 100% out of action. And this was a strategic analysis of the situation that Lord Gilliman himself also concurred with. In light of recent events, there did not appear to be any way in which the Ultramarines Legion could effectively support the rest of the Imperium in the fight against Horus's rebels. The first and most obvious problem was of course the Ruin Storm itself, which appeared to pose a near impassable barrier between Ultramar and the Imperium. Gilliman of course dispatched countless scout ships to see if there was any stable route through it, but there did not appear to be any such routes. And even if the Ultramarine Legion was so inclined as to simply throw itself at the storm, hoping that whatever minuscule percentage of their total forces might make it through to the other side could be of some help to the Imperium, uh, 
If they did this, they would leave the entirety of Ultramar space completely and utterly defenseless against the heretical horde still roaming within its borders. And that did not seem like an altogether good trade in Gilliman's view. The few thousand, maybe, Ultramarines that could have made it through the Ruin Storm, if Gilliman was to be optimistic, would be paltry aid to the Imperium, whereas the complete and utter loss of Ultramar, all of its worlds, all of its population and all of its resources, would be an incalculable boon to the rebels. It'd be like pissing in somebody's porridge only to be submerged in an ocean of fecal matter in turn. Not a very good trade. And so Gilliman, bereft of all other options, was forced to commit what he himself considered both a treasonous and heretical action. The foundation of Imperium Secundus. For whilst it appeared that the Imperium of Man could not be saved, the ideals for which it stood and had fought, the ideals of his father, whom he had tried to bring to the wider galaxy, they could possibly still be saved. However, Gilliman was of course entirely aware of the inconvenient fact that once the rebels were done with the Imperium, they would turn their eyes upon Ultramar, and if they had created the Ruin Storm, odds were pretty goddamn good that they could also uncreate it. I mean, it would certainly give a certain degree of warning to the Ultramarines as well, when the massive omnipresent ruin storm suddenly lifted like a fart in a mild afternoon breeze, it probably meant that the rebels were on their way. Or, well, could you even call them rebels at that point, when presumably they had already defeated the entire Imperium and created a near-galaxy-spanning empire of their own? Hmm. At what point does a civil war stop being a civil war, I suppose? But uh, that is not a question for this video, so let us move on to Gilliman's preparations. For he recognised the undeniable fact that even though he was still in command of most of Ultramar, one of the largest, most prosperous, well-developed and advanced sections in the galaxy, Holding off the entire rest of the galaxy under the command of the War Master would be a mild challenge at absolute least. And even worse than the material inconveniences, such as the Imperium having far more in the way of logistical support, in production capabilities, in manpower and infrastructure, However reduced it may have been by the lengthy conflict, it would still almost certainly dwarf the Ultima Segmentum quite considerably. The far bigger problem than any of that was the fact that Gilliman was going to have a legion, and not even a fully intact legion. The Ultramarines had been battered at Kalth, and they were still now dealing with forces of the Word Bearers and the World Eaters running rampant within Ultramar. By the time the War Master had finished off the rest of the galaxy and turned his gaze upon Ultima Segmentum, the boys in blue would be much reduced and the only reinforcement they could reliably expect to receive from the other legions would be whatever scattered and lost remnants were either in the Ruin Storm, which miraculously found their way out into the Ultima Segmentum, or those scattered and desperate survivors who had somehow managed to escape the War Master so far. Referring to the Ultramarine's position in such a scenario as merely outnumbered would singularly fail to represent the levels of hopeless sodomy the Blueberry Marines were in for. I could come up with some more fitting euphemisms and examples, but they would all include more or less a dozen or so extraordinarily burly black men and one very tiny white girl. And those kinds of examples are not particularly welcome on YouTube, so I shall refrain from making the comparison. Suffice to say, things were looking mighty dark indeed for Rubute Gilliman's Imperium Secundus. <laughs> 
And the Primarch was of course painfully aware of all of this. First and foremost, he would have to deal with the remaining Word Bearer and World Eater forces still engaged in the so-called Shadow Crusade within the Ultima Segmentum, and presuming these could be dealt with, he would then have to prepare his Segmentum for the non-too-tender administrations of the Arch-Traitor Horus as it seemed inevitable that he would eventually win the war on the other side of the galaxy, the Ultramarines and whatever allied forces they could potentially gather would eventually be faced with holding off the victorious Warmasters of Ravenous Hordes. It all seemed like a bit of a hopeless situation really, but Gilliman was not a creature overly inclined to surrender himself to apathy and so he began the search for any possible solution to his predicament. And the seemingly inescapable conclusion was both simultaneously impossible and unavoidable. The only path to salvation was if the Ultramarines Legion and any possible allies they might gather along the way were to fight far beyond their abilities. If they could defeat the enemy in any field of battle, in any circumstance, and in any condition. If you are at all a person inclined to pessimism, you might say that this was a bit of a tall order. To defeat the Death Guard in attritional warfare, to bludgeon and barrage the World Eaters into submission, and to crush and crack the fortresses of the Iron Warriors all whilst drastically outnumbered. Yeah, it does seem like a bit much, but in a situation where you literally have no other choice, Gilliman's only real option was to try and find a way to achieve, well, the impossible. And his solution was to write the Codex Astartes. First and foremost, it was far more than merely just a book of tactics. It reorganized the Ultramarines Legion in every single regard. Its entire organizational structure, the size and makeup of squads, of companies, of chapters, of battalions, even of individual heavy weapons units, the composition of those armaments. The 13th also received a complete command structure rework, with Gilliman going from the very top to the very bottom, reassigning commanders to higher and lower levels of command, and switching them around the structures of the various companies, chapters, and formations. Somebody who had been commanding tactical squads all his life may suddenly be moved over to commanding devastators. And someone with no experience at the highest echelons of command may suddenly find himself in charge of entire theatres of warfare. And fitting of a Primarch's judgement, virtually without exception, these individuals proved themselves far more capable in their new roles than they had ever been in their old ones, at the very least as far as adherence to the Codex Astartes was concerned. And there's a very important word as well, adherence. Before this, the Ultramarines Legion had certainly been rather ramrod straight, perhaps not quite to the level of the Imperial Fists, but the Ultramarines had quite the reputation for having not mere sticks, but fully grown trees sprouting from their anuses. They were not particularly flexible, although there was some degree of levity within their command structure, though not everyone was fond of that either. Indeed, during the early trials of the Codex Astartes, we see a couple examples where the perceived levity is blamed directly for the state in which the galaxy has found itself. Standards, as they said, standards slipped and so the whole merry mess began. In the case of the Codex Astartes, however, it demanded far more in the ways of blind obedience than previous Ultramarine scriptures, although still with a degree of freedom, it is important to point out, though we will get to that in a little bit. 
For by and large, the Codex Astartes was far more prescriptive than it was descriptive. It laid out fairly clear directives for what a commander in the field should do under any given circumstance, how he should organise his men, how he should deploy them, how he should transport them, how he should train them, how he should indoctrinate them, how he should motivate them, etc, etc, etc. And of course, the Codex was not meant purely for the higher command echelons either. It was really meant to be the ultimate tome that contained all a space marine would ever need to know. Training regimes, bolter drills, maintenance procedures, strategy, personal battle mantras, meditation patterns to enhance calm and tactical analysis, every last single little thing from a planetary invasion stratagem to how to locate a satisfactory source of asswipe on a desert world. But of course, a lot of that is simple guidelines, rules and regulations, so we shan't focus too much upon that. Rather, let us talk about how the Codex Astartes would actually be applied to a real-life situation. First and foremost, it would be completely and utterly worthless to any unaugmented human. The Codex Astartes is a gargantuan tome penned by a Primarch intended to well, again, contain absolutely everything. It would be far beyond any mortal man, regardless of how much time he was given, to learn and much less so understand the entire bloody thing. For a space marine, however, with an eidetic memory, that was not an issue whatsoever. Every single Ultramarine's Legionnaire quite literally had the entire book memorized. And not just memorized either. Due to the way their minds have been reshaped and structured to make them the ultimate soldiers, they are also able to compartmentalize and search through their memory with incredible efficiency. Think of it as an internet search engine. Literally all of human knowledge gathered in one spot and the only limitation as to your ability to learn and understand are your own mental faculties. And in the case of an Adeptus Astartes Legionnaire, that isn't really much of a limitation at all. It's not just the big old muscles that makes a space marine so dangerous, it is also their mental capabilities. As I mentioned, they have the entire book memorized, and they are also able to search through it based upon applicable parameters. An Ultramarine's Legionnaire would first gather all of the available information available to him, from his own experience, his own perception of the battlefield situation, his helmet sensorium readout, support from other nearby squads, then second and third hand information, then what can be verified, what cannot be verified, what seems likely, what seems unlikely, so on and so on and so on. And the more information available to him, the more complex this search parameter becomes. The more information he has available, say, the difference between a squad sergeant trying to figure out the best solution to a firefight he's engaged in, how to best engage the enemy whilst minimizing the exposure of his own squad, compared to a theater commander, which has access to the reports of hundreds if not thousands of officers in the field, advanced sensorium readouts, and countless other information nodes. All of this will then be gathered inside of the Legionnaire's mind, and refined and chiseled away at until a clear problem has been created. This might sound like a lengthy process, and for a human it would probably be the work of a decade or two, but for a space marine it is the literal computation works of mere seconds, a biological supercomputer. And then, now that the actual problem, the question, has been clearly defined, he can then apply that to the Codex Astartes, and find as close to a match within the Primarch's great tome as possible. Once discovered, this problem will then give a series of potential solutions. One example we have of a problem presented during the early trials of the Codex Astartes presented no less than 24 different solutions to the commander at the time. Just imagine that for a second. You have a problem, and you are given 
24 solutions to that problem. 24 solutions that all seem equally valid. That alone would probably be enough to overwhelm most mortal minds with indecision, with second guessing, and with attempts to recheck the problem to see if there's any kind of little error, little niggle here and there that might narrow down the choices further. But once again, due to the mental faculties of an Astartes, this is made a hell of a lot easier. A solution is quickly selected, and then from that, the combat scenario is further refined, leading to yet another search through the good old database, leading to another problem and another set of solutions, and so on and so on and so on. Or leaving seemingly inescapably and inevitably so to the final conclusion, an Ultramarine's victory. Seems simple enough, right? I mean, after all, the Astartes brain makes this possible. So in the end, it isn't even that impressive nor impossible to come up with a solution to every scenario. Since you can just, you know, leaf through it with your superhuman mind. But, of course, there is one tinsy wincy little detail. Namely, for your superhuman mind to be able to leaf through all of these solutions, you first actually have to have them all organized in a database. This needs to be created, and let us examine what kind of a behemoth book this would ever had to be. In the example given in the short story Rules of Engagement, a tactical conundrum is refined and matched to one in the Codex, which in turn presents 24 different solutions. Alright. Assuming this is yet another step on the road towards inevitable victory, picking one of these choices would lead to a new situation, taking into account the actions of opposing and friendly forces, as well as a pinch of unavoidable battlefield confusion and chaos, we would then arrive at a fresh set of parameters, to be refined and then matched again in the Codex. Let us, for the sake of argument, assume that the Autist-in-Chief, Rabuti Gilliman, has prepared 24 solutions to any situation he could come up with. It certainly does seem like the kind of over-the-top bureaucratic nonsense that Papa Smurf would engage in, does it not? Uh, that would mean that every single solitary battlefield eventuality would have 24 resolutions, which would in turn lead to another 24 theoretical developments, and therefore 24 new set of circumstances each, requiring 24 options of their very own, meaning that after just two choices, we are looking at 601 possibilities, and all of these would of course require their own detailed examples their own entry into the Codex Astartes that could be identified via available battlefield information and then refined to the scenario that fits it best. And assuming the battle is still not quite won, requiring one further refinement and one further choice, then we are looking at 14,424 different solutions. Now, of course, there would obviously be some overlap. A solution may be applicable to more than one scenario, but regardless, we are looking at a book here that needs to take into consideration every single conceivable tactical situation on the battlefield. A rather hectic and chaotic place. And in all due likelihood, then, it would have to contain, at the very least, tens of thousands of different scenarios, and probably hundreds of thousands. I don't think it would be uh, too much to say that such a tome could never have been written by a mere mortal, and hell, even crediting a Primarch with writing such a work almost seems a little bit much, but Gilliman did it, and Gilliman hammered it into his legion. He also hammered into them the necessity of coldly and dispassionately seeing the situation for what it truly was. Because at the end of the day, the Codex Astartes is nothing more than a framework. It presents a situation, and then a series of potential solutions to that situation. If you either do not have the abilities to carry out the expected solutions, 
because you cannot expect your troops to actually do so to the letter, for example, or if you are unwilling to take that solution because you view the sacrifices that may be inherent in taking it as too much, well, the Codex Astartes is not commanding a battle. It is merely advising the commander on how he could best conduct his campaign. And of course, that part of the book, the advice as to direct strategy and tactics, well, that's just a part of the book. We still haven't even begun to touch upon the organizational aspects, which shows you charts and information on which leaders might be more effective where, on what kind of a rank order would be best within a chapter, the kind of organization that the Space Marines should adopt, in this case, the chapter organization, divided into ten companies, with one first elite company and a tenth reserve slash training scout company. It might further suggest the organizational structure of these companies, how many squads, how many persons per squad, the weapon loadout in each squad, when and where heavy weapons should be issued, whether or not a company should be a dedicated company, a tactical company for example, or an assault company, or a fast assault company, or a heavy devastator company, and so on and so on, and how these formations should then be organized in the field of battle. Should multiple companies be deployed next to one another, or should squads be swapped out between companies? If so, why? What are the benefits? What are the downsides? And so on and so on and so on. This thing must have been thousands upon thousands of pages, and we do know that he supposedly wrote an actual book on all of this as well, though I am sure that most of the copies, quote unquote, would almost certainly be digital, so that they could be handed out throughout the entire Ultramarines Legion during the Horus Heresy, because, well, that alone would require many, many, many thousands of copies. And again, considering the sheer girth of this thing, even just transporting it, I imagine, it would be an interesting challenge. Not exactly something you just clip onto your belt and go. But it did succeed. The Codex Astartes was created and the Ultramarines Legion was taught its lessons. So what was its actual impact upon reality? How did it actually work out? Because again, I don't think it would work with mere mortal troops. Even if we could potentially dream up a commander, perhaps aided by supercomputers to fine and refine the precise scenario, the precise tactical question, and so on and so on, would the troops on the ground follow these instructions blindly, even when they appear to go against what seems to be the best solution on the ground. I don't know. Maybe in the case of a supremely disciplined formation, but eventually I think they would simply just break, or begin acting upon their own judgement, and the moment one squad does this, the entire tender, perfectly laid out ballet of the Codex Astartes sweeping battle plan will start unravelling. We saw yet further examples of this in the short story Rules of Engagement, where whilst the Codex Astartes did provide ultimate victory, the path it occasionally took to that victory appeared incomprehensible not just for the commanders on the ground carrying out the tactical orders, but even for the commanders on high giving out the strategic directives. And in such a situation where the commanders and the soldiers are both doubting their directives, I don't think it would be long before some of them started to take personal initiative, shall we say. However, despite the Codex Astartes proving effective, being able to lead the Ultramarines to simulated victory over the word bearers, over the salamanders, and over the death guards in scenarios that should naturally favour these opposition forces, it was eventually defeated by forces, simulated forces, of the Sons of Horus, commanded by Horus Lupercal, today played for us by Robuti Gilliman himself. 
This was to be the ultimate test of the Codex Astartes, to see if it could actually stand up to the brilliance of a real Primarch, if this um, paperback version of a Primarch could actually deal with the real thing. The answer to that would appear to have been a resounding no. Because at the end of the day, a point that Gilliman himself made was that the Codex Astartes was always meant to be a advisor, a general directive, and it should never be taken as complete and utter gospel. Which is an interesting point because it seems to contradict the previous idea that if the plan is not followed perfectly, then the larger strategy will begin to unravel. So I suppose what Gilliman is trying to say is that there needs to be a perfect balance between doctrine and innovation. I don't remember who said it, but I seem to remember a quote going something along the lines of, one should only innovate after having developed a solid foundament rooted in doctrine. And that is kind of the idea here. In 9 out of 10 combat engagements, as described in the Codex Astartes, the Codex will give the correct solution. But in the case you end up in that 10th unique scenario, then the commanders must still be able to react swiftly, and be able to understand and divorce themselves from the Codex Astartes. This was the example given in the practice round against Gilderman as well, where the Ultramarines carried out the defense of MacLag precisely as instructed to do so by the Codex Astartes. But since its literal author was on the other side of the field on that particular occasion, he could immediately and precisely predict every single move the Space Marines made, and then counter that move with one of his own, one that he knew there was no proper answer for in the Codex Astartes, or at the very least not one that could be deployed swiftly enough. This proves that whilst the Codex Astartes is an unbelievably complex work of strategy and tactics that will probably be found flawless in the vast majority of circumstances, it cannot be a substitute for true strategic brilliance. This unfortunately appears to be a lesson that has passed the Ultramarines uh, somewhat by, since a rigid adherence to the Codex Astartes is viewed not only as a virtue, but by many within the Ultramarines chapter as a required part of being an Ultramarine, and those who question the Codex's teachings in the worst case scenario, can actually be brought up on charges for it, or at the very least, should one of their decisions be found to be in error, the Codex Astartes could be used as de facto evidence of what the correct solution should have been to judge the commander, who then apparently made the incorrect decision. This somewhat... Uh Zealous adherence to the Codex Astartes is, whilst not completely unique to the Ultramarines chapter and their successor chapters, it is definitely a bit on the extreme end. Most chapters in the modern 41st millennium are organised at least to some degree along the lines placed out by Gilliman. If, for nothing else, then at the very least their chapter-level organisation, and the ruling that no single Astartes formation should be larger than a thousand warriors. At least those who do, basically disregard these teachings, do so whilst paying lip service to the Codex Astartes, not so much for the sake of Gilliman or the Ultramarine's Legion, but rather to Imperial authorities. The Space Wolves, for example, still maintain their original organisational structure of great companies, and they can consist of a hell of a lot more than a hundred warriors. <laughs>
As for the other teachings of the Codex Astartes in relation to its battlefield uses or its use in training or indoctrination, these are followed to a greater or a lesser degree. Many have adopted quite a lot of the theories presented in the Codex Astartes for no other reason than because they seem solid. Training regimes, for example, are usually not overly ideological, and what works for an ultramarine probably probably would work just fine for a blood angel, or a dark angel, or technically even possibly a space wolf, although the latter do tend to adopt their own uh, training systems for the most part. As for battlefield strategy and so on, this is where it differentiates a little bit more. Whilst the ultramarines follow the book as if it was the literal word of Rebute Gilliman, which in a way, it kind of is, the various other chapters view it far more as a tactical guide, a, a primer, a instructional book, a, well, teaching book, essentially. Something that they read, they learn, and then they apply the lessons therein, rather than follow those lessons blindly. Ironically enough, this means that the chapters who are following the Codex Astartes closest to Gilliman's own wishes are in fact the other chapters, rather than his own ultramarines who have become somewhat lost in the dogma of the Codex Astartes. But how did these other chapters even come about utilising the Codex Astartes? Because first and foremost, Gilliman wrote this tome for his own legion, to help them defend against the traitorous hordes that would almost certainly descend upon Ultramar. But after seeing the extent of the civil war, Gilliman began to believe that it would be best if the legions were split up, so as to avoid any conflict on such a scale ever happening again. Many of his brothers, however, did not agree with this. Many of them were very resistant towards having their legions broken up, although others took to it with a great deal of fervour. The Blood Angels, for example. You might think that they would be one of the most individualistic of legions and the most resistance to the new order. But without Sanguinius to lead them, they simply desired any order. Whether or not it would have been the one their Primarch would have chosen for them, in their grief, that was not really a decision they were capable of making. And on the other hand, those you might have thought would be most susceptible to such a change in doctrine, formations like the Imperial Fists, for example, they resisted it quite vehemently. Rogal Dorn was utterly convinced that if such a threat was ever to arise again, whether it be from chaos or in some other form, the Imperial Fists would have to remain united to be able to face it effectively. Although even he did eventually relent and began splitting up his legion, although Dorn left in a little bit of a safeguard. If the Imperium should ever again need the full force of the Imperial Fist's legion, then such a protocol would be also then such a protocol would also be available. The so-called Last Wall, where all of the Imperial Fist successor chapters would come together under a unified command structure to resist whatever it is that was encroaching upon the Imperium. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, perhaps even a sign of the necessity and the usefulness of Gilliman's doctrine, by the time it came to actually utilise the Last Wall, it turned out that the Imperial Fist's successor chapters had deviated so much from one another that having them operate again as a legion was practically impossible. An interesting thing, those that resisted it the most turned out to not only benefit from the chapter structure, but indeed turned out to prefer it. It may be that only a Primarch could ever truly command a legion of space marines. 
Once left to their own devices, they tend to bicker and compete with one another. Very rarely do they find a leader that they can all fully unify behind. The only examples of that in modern 40k would probably be Dante, the leader of the Blood Angels, who is pretty much universally accepted by the successor chapters as well, with one or two honourable exceptions. And all the way at the end here, let us discuss the impact of the Codex Astartes upon modern day 40k. Because it has most definitively had a considerable effect upon the organisation, the structure and the operation of loyalist space marine chapters, for better or for worse. On the upside, it has created a much more unified type of command structure, allowing the Space Marine chapters to operate in various parts of the galaxy in an effective fashion, which may not have been possible with the old organisational structure of the Legions, which was often built up in rather fascinating and unique ways. One Legion may have a very different interpretation of what a company is supposed to be than another, whilst these days all chapters at the very least pay lip service to the organisational structure of the Codex Astartes, because whilst most follow it, some still do take some liberties. The Space Wolves, as usual, being the perfect example of a more libertarian approach to prescriptive rules and regulations. And of course, the beneficial effects of following the Codex Astartes should not be looked down upon. This was a book written by a Primarch, he knew a thing or two about organising formations, about training space marines, about how to best deploy them, where best to deploy them, and how to utilise them in any given combat situation. Undoubtedly, any space marine commander would benefit from at least giving it a quick once over. And whilst certainly blind adherence to the rules of the Codex Astartes is not necessarily the best course of action, nor the intended course of action, it is still an incredibly valuable tome of wisdom, a pocket book primark in a way. On the other hand, on the downside, whilst the organisation of the Space Marine Legions into chapters has allowed a far greater degree of compartmentalization, which has prevented larger scale uprisings, if a single chapter turns to chaos, then it is, due to the various traditions of other chapters, unlikely to be able to influence all that many others. There has been exception to this rule, like for example, the Badab Crusade, which will be coming as a larger lore series probably near the second half of this year. Look forward to that one. But by and large, the chapter structure has been successful in limiting the fallout of those chapters that have turned out to be a bit more susceptible to the lure of the Dark Gods than others. This has also proven effective when the... Uh, Mechanicus has developed a bit of a explorative and experimental streak, like the Cursed Founding, for example. You probably did not want a Legion of Lamenters or Black Dragons, although in the second example, the Black Dragons, despite their clear physical mutation, have proven remarkably loyal, so perhaps you would have wanted a bigger force of them. The downside, however, to this organisational structure is that there is only a thousand Astartes in every single chapter, and due to the demands of warfare and the somewhat limited availability of recruits worthy of joining the Adeptus Astartes, usually any given chapter is operating at about maybe 80 to 90 percent at best, or possibly considerably lower. If a Space Marine chapter experienced heavy casualties, perhaps as much as half the chapter's formation, or even more, uh, 
That is a devastating blow to the chapter, and will make it practically combat ineffective for decades at least and potentially centuries, since their ranks will have to be replenished, but they cannot lower their standards. If a chapter can only get 10 decent recruits every few years, then rebuilding a company-sized formation alone might take a decade or more. Rebuilding half a chapter? That is going to take quite a while indeed, especially when we take into consideration that there are very, very few chapters indeed that would be so patient as to sideline themselves for the duration of the rebuilding process. For that to happen, they're gonna have to be very, very badly mauled. And even then, they might decide that um, death and glory is preferable to slowly fading away as they rebuild their chapter over the next thousand years. This has meant that Space Marines are less able to meet large-scale enemy incursions. A Space Marine Legion would in all due likelihood have made pretty damn short work of any Tyranid Hive fleet the galaxy has yet seen. Whereas individual chapters, that makes it a lot more complicated to deal with what is essentially an existential threat to the galaxy as a whole, not just the Imperium. Chaos, of course, also presents a rather dire threat too, and as Abaddon, the Despoiler, has demonstrated, he is able to gather pretty goddamn vast forces around himself. Somehow. You'd think that a warlord who failed 13 times before would be drawing a bit less of a crowd in these heretical days, but such is not the case and it is damn difficult for chapter-sized formations to deal with vast quantities of traitor space marines. There is of course also the advantage of having a somewhat to a degree shared command structure, at least when a chapter meets another chapter, they know roughly the layout and composition of the other, and can therefore to a degree assume the capabilities of the other chapter, easing cooperation at least a little bit, but in reality, the various chapters' interpretation of the Codex Astartes, their own traditions, their own habits, their own flat-out cultures within the chapters, usually mean that there are only a very few chapters that truly work well alongside one another. And this in turn means that even if you were to get 10,000 Space Marines, 10 full chapters to fight against a Tyranid incursion, what you would in effect have is not an organized force of 10,000 Space Marines. You would have 10 chapters. Still an absolutely astounding fighting formation, don't get me wrong, but it must be stressed that these would be 10 individual formations, with at the very best a very loose and probably exceptionally argumentative command structure. As demonstrated with the last wall, even those who once fought within the same legion can have deviated to the point of being outright hostile towards one another in the modern Imperium. And with that, I will wrap up this video on the Codex Astartes. I hope you've received a little bit of a better understanding, and as usual these days, I will ask you to share the video around if you can be bothered, as it does help the channel out an absolute ton, as YouTube cannot be trusted to do it for me, so I am simply going to have to beg you all to help me out a little bit if you can take the time. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. We will be doing a few shorter, more theoretical videos over the next few weeks, so that I'll get a little bit of time to plan out the Badab War series, because... Well, you all saw Vrax, didn't you? They're a pretty damn hefty undertaking, these large ones, but goddamn are they not fun as well. Have a good day.